Um, hope you guys can see me okay. Um, not a big deal if you can't. It's mostly about the presentation and me talking and then hopefully a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. All right, uh, just get ready to go here. Um, I think a few people are gonna trickle in in the next couple of minutes, but everybody's time is precious. Uh, so I just really wanna get going and uh, yeah, share some information with you all tonight. Um, so I'm just gonna launch this presentation. Let me know in the chat if you can't see this presentation somehow, but it should be full screen now. Just a cover page there uh, with stoked dogs. So this is the pandemic puppies webinar. Um, really, we're just gonna talk tonight about the current pandemic puppy situation. And then uh, I built this whole presentation and talk actually around the feedback that I got through the registration form. Uh, so a lot of you shared some of the issues that you're struggling with. Um, and I built it based on the most common issues. Um, I won't get to touch on everything because I don't think you all wanna sit here for hours on end, uh, but I can at least uh, touch on a couple of things and hopefully help uh, some of you who are dealing with some puppy issues. Um, I really I feel for everybody who's gotten a puppy this year. Um, I know people even got puppies um, not purposely during a pandemic, you know, they just had one on hold with a breeder for a specific litter. And then you might be going, oh gosh, what do I do? There's no puppy classes and, and so on. So hopefully today will help you all with that. Just really quickly about Stoke Dogs. So Stoke Dogs is my company. I just uh, launched it. I'm a dog trainer with almost a decade of experience now. I used to teach at a bigger facility in Calgary. Um, and then I moved to Rebel Stoke earlier this year, just before the pandemic. And uh, my plan was to set up shop right away. But the pandemic kind of slowed me down. Um, and then I decided I just couldn't wait any longer. I really missed working with dogs. Uh, so I, I started up Stoke Dogs. Uh, my philosophy is really about science-based dog training. And what, what that means is really um, going off what the science says. Um, so, you know, we know a lot of things about dogs because dogs have been researched so much uh, for decades now. There's tons of great information out there. Um, we don't have to continue to use outdated um, kind of uh, pack leader ideas, um, you know, which have all been disproven. Uh, we really can focus on more humane methods. And the great news is that they actually work a lot better for dogs. So that's my favorite part. Um, I am a CPDTKA. That just means I'm certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed. So I had to accumulate a specific amount of hours working with dogs in order to take a test and um, achieve a relatively high score in order um, to be certified. So there is no uh, requirement to be certified to call yourself a dog trainer. As a warning to those of you who may not know, um, that means that you, um, if you've never even worked with a dog, could wake up tomorrow and call yourself a dog trainer. And it's led to some unfortunate uh, situations out there where dogs have been harmed and, and put through a lot of suffering in the name of dog training. So. Always look for certified, well-educated, well-experienced dog trainers. And if you are ever looking for recommendations uh, in your area, I'm happy to provide some input on that. So today we'll go through the current puppy pandemic situation and uh, what that means. And then we're gonna focus on all of these topics. I'm gonna spend um, quite a bit of time at the end, I think on fear, uh, I was, um, disappointed but not surprised uh, to see that, oh gosh, sorry, I need to admit somebody. And I can't, sorry, everybody. Ah, there we go. Um, I'm just gonna leave it like this just for a minute here uh, in case somebody else is joining because it wouldn't let me click to let them in. Um, anyways, so yeah, I'm going to talk about fear uh, towards the end of the presentation. I just wanna spend quite a bit of time um, going over that. I, yeah, was saying I was saddened but not surprised that a lot of you are dealing with fear. Um, that's one of the things that uh, we commonly see uh, with the 
situation that we have right now where there's just a shortage of dogs and then there's difficulty with socializing them. And yeah, it's just a, a bit of a reality, unfortunately. Um, but we'll talk about you know, what is normal for fear in puppies and then what's not normal and when we should be kind of seeking some extra help because it is a really complex issue. Love that sound. So the current pandemic puppy situation. So puppies are right now really hard to come by. Um, actually just dogs, there's shelters that are actually empty all over. Um, it's really something else when you think about it that um, you know, before we were, you know, euthanizing dogs left and right, unfortunately, because it couldn't find homes for them. Not saying that dogs aren't being euthanized anymore. Um, but uh, nowadays, we are having trouble finding dogs. Um, breeders have long, long wait lists. Um, yeah, rescues are have no dogs. As an example, this isn't everywhere, obviously. Um, but what that has led to um, is a situation where people are adopting puppies that they don't know where they're coming from, unfortunately, or they're really questionable um, brokers, potentially, you know, puppy brokers, somebody who kind of like works with a puppy mill um, to sell puppies and make it seem like they're a breeder. And what that means is that they're not reputable breeders. Um, and that means that they're likely not putting much work into early life socialization, which is really critical. They're also not um, putting any uh, work into, you know, making sure it's good genetics. It's another example. And this isn't just unique to this current situation. You know, there's bad breeders out there everywhere. Um, and, you know, with uh, shelter puppies and rescue puppies, that's a different story. You know, a lot of times these puppies are being rescued from the outdoors and you just don't even have that information. And I'm not trying to say one is better than the other. Um, but that's the current situation right now is people are essentially adopting whatever puppies they can get. And that is potentially going to create some new issues, especially uh, for these puppies who are right now growing up in this new world with these routines that are probably going to drastically change about a year from now. Um, they're also spending so much time with their owners. They're not getting enough sleep. So um, myself and other trainers have really noticed that puppies are being kept up way too long because people are home, right? So not every puppy is gonna sleep really easily in a room with activity. Some of them need a quiet space to sleep. And if you are one of those new puppy owners, you need um, to make sure that your puppy has probably around 18 hours of sleep a day. Now this is different for every puppy, <laughs> but uh, it's not that different. So if your puppy's sleeping eight hours a day, that's not enough. Um, they are just like toddlers and what happens is that when they don't rest enough they actually look like they need more exercise and stimulation they get a little bit stir crazy really over aroused very very excited and people go oh my god i gotta do more to get this puppy to sleep but in fact we have to do less we have to create some calm spaces for them we have to really help them learn that they can be calm Another thing that we're seeing is a lack of critical socialization. So socialization is the most important thing to work on when you get home with your puppy. I would even put it above potty training, but um, you know, potty training is such a frustrating um, bad habit when they have accidents that everybody wants to work on that right away. And you can, you can do that and socialization, uh, but socialization is just so critical. And the reason is we'll get into it really shortly um, that there's a, a short window where we can socialize our puppies most effectively. So what does this mean for everybody who's gotten a pandemic puppy? It means that some of you are maybe already or will be struggling with behavioral issues, especially if you've um, struggled on socialization. And if you have, don't feel bad. Um, this is just the reality of the situation. It's hard, we're all learning to adapt. And then uh, some of them are seeing increase in fear. So, um, and fear caused behaviors. So what I mean by that is things like barking, um, things like reactivity. And then a lot of people are gonna be in for some future behavioral challenges, unfortunately. Um, so luckily not all of this is inevitable. Some of it uh, will work out okay. And uh, for those of you who are struggling, there are people who can help. So 
right now I'm just in the process of setting my dog up for success um, by giving him some enrichment items while uh, we have this session tonight because he's a senior who is uh, quite noise reactive. We got a lot of snow today and we just insulated our attic and it sounds different when it falls off the roof and he likes to bark <laughs> so when that happens because he's not used to it. So I'm setting him up for success with some enrichment toys. So you might see me grab some stuff and hand it to him and you'll probably hear him licking in the background. I'm sorry. So I'm going to try to start this presentation again. Hopefully everybody who uh, was going to be here is here and let's get into socialization. So I know some of you guys will already know this. I've seen the attendee list and some of you are, are quite educated already. Uh, but the, for those who don't, the critical socialization stage uh, for dog owners, um, and I say dog owners because, you know, socialization starts actually quite earlier, uh, but our breeders or the people with the rescue with the puppies, they will be working on that socialization. It's not in the hands of the owner or adopting family. So for owners and adopting families, it is seven to 12 weeks. And so I don't wanna say that you can't socialize past 12 weeks. This is just the critical, most important socialization window because during this time, our puppies' minds are really open. They're curious, they see something new and they go, what is that? Oh my God, this looks so interesting. And they wanna check it out. They wanna interact with it. And as they get older, that starts to go from, oh, what is that to, oh, what is that? Could that hurt me? Is this bad? Should I be scared of this? And that's why we wanna start building those positive associations between their environment, what they encounter, how they feel about it right in that seven to 12 week period. So how much should you socialize your puppy? Um, there's a golden rule out there, and I'm not entirely sure if it was Ian Dunbar who came out with it a long time ago. Um, maybe it was somebody else, but um, of course, got somebody else who needs to be admitted. <laughs> ah, what is it? All right. Um, so I'll just <laughs> leave it like this. Hopefully, everybody can still see it. That way, I can easily admit new people. Um, so, yeah, how much should you socialize your puppy? Um, 100 people by 12 weeks is one of the golden rules. Um, and that's 100 different people. That's really hard to do in a pandemic. So um, in a minute here, we'll get into how could we even try to do that. Um, you also should be socializing your puppy every single day. And that's something you absolutely can do even during a pandemic. Um, we'll also get into that. But that's how important it is. Um, when I have clients who have puppies. I say the number one priority is socialization, socialization, socialization. A well-socialized puppy will have a much easier time in life. They'll have a much easier time adapting to new unexpected uh, things in life. They'll just um, have an easier go of it in general. And uh, that, that's why it's so critical because we can't go back in time. Once they're out of that period, we, we'd never get another opportunity. Whereas we have the entire lives of our dogs to work on loose leash walking. We have their entire lives to work on sit, stay, all that. We do not have that time with socialization. So um, it should be the number one priority for all new puppy owners um, out there. What should you socialize your puppy with? Oh, this is one of my favorite topics because there's just so many things. Um, I actually, for my clients, create a, uh, like, it's almost like a socialization bingo sheet <laughs> because uh, there's so many things you need to socialize with. So people is one of them, but I don't want you to think, okay, just like people. No, you should be trying to find um, diverse people, people who are tall, people who are short, people who are really big, people who are small, people who are on rollerblades, people who are on skateboards, people who are on bikes. Um, a lot of times dogs react to people on bikes and, and rollerblades and skateboards because they go, whoa, that looks like a person, but that's not moving like a person. That's really scary. So we want our puppies to learn that people come in all different shapes and sizes and also come uh, with, you know, maybe some things kind of attached like a bike, right? Because we can see a bike would almost look attached to a, per to a person for a dog. So we really want to uh, socialize them with people and the activities that people do. 
and just a diverse group of people. Again, we'll get into how can we do that in a minute. Um, we also want to socialize our puppy with different noises. Um, noise phobias are a pretty common thing for dogs, especially things like fireworks, um, things like thunder. Right now we're getting into the winter. This is always kind of a tougher one um, to expose your puppy to easily, or sorry, safely um, in the winter because you know there aren't really fireworks going on. And especially in the pandemic year, there was also a lot less of that. So how can you socialize your puppy with different sounds? Well, first focus on the sounds that are gonna be in your neighborhood. You know, Do you have a freight train corridor nearby? You'll wanna go socialize your puppy with that train. Um, so just so that they're not afraid of it because it's really, really loud. Light rail is the same thing. Buses, cars, um, you know, maybe church bells, things that you'll hear often. And then for things that don't happen as often, YouTube is a fantastic resource for sounds. And when you're working with sounds on a speaker, what you want to do is turn up that volume really, really slowly. So just like working incrementally, not just blaring the thunder sounds as an example. That's a really good way where you could scare your puppy, unfortunately. Um, we also want to uh, uh, socialize them with surfaces. So, you know, think of your puppy as walking around barefoot for their lives because they mostly will. And you want to make sure they're comfortable on carpet, hardwood, concrete, um, metal grates are often used in like bridges for hiking. That's a really good one to get. If you don't have any nearby, I like to use like a, a pen or a metal crate, just like kind of collapse and get the puppy to explore walking on that. Um, things like that, uh, that your puppy is just gonna come into at some point in their life, get them used to it. And then also you wanna socialize them with different objects. So, um, you know, th think of things around your house that maybe don't come up too often. Uh, right now is a great time to socialize our puppies with Christmas trees as an example and uh, teach them some good behavior around that. Also probably wanting to use some management so they don't have access to the tree until they've understood how to interact with that tree. Um, but we, you know, things like strollers are a great one, uh, bikes, uh, skateboards, um, all kinds of different objects that they'll just run into uh, periodically. We wanna make sure that they're really comfortable with it uh, over the long run. So that's um, kind of just a really quick list of ideas of things to socialize your puppy with. Now, how um, can we socialize these things? First, I'll just talk about generally socializing our puppies. So even with the people, the noises, the surfaces, and the objects, it has to be positive. So what does that mean? It means I'm not taking a puppy and forcing them to interact with the person. I'm not taking a puppy and putting them on a new surface. I'm instead going to have treats with me all of the time. So I have my treat pouch on me right now. I don't always wear it around the house, uh, but I certainly do when I'm on Zoom calls because it makes it easier if you know somebody decides to come knock at my door and my dogs are maybe struggling for a moment. Um, so that's a really good way uh, to change um, their emotional state. Food is really powerful. So having rewards with you and then using them as you introduce something. So if I'm introducing that new surface, Maybe I put a couple treats just right near that surface, get my puppy really excited to be checking it out. And then I'm gonna just slowly encourage my puppy to go interact with that. But I don't want to force my puppy um, to step onto it. I just put treats kind of nearby and I work my way slowly up, always making sure that they're comfortable. You know, they have that loose, excited body language and they're not stiff and leaning away from whatever it is. That's something I see a lot uh, with people who have um, fearful puppies is, is just um, socializing a little bit. Um, I don't want to say too roughly, but you know, forcing the puppies being like, well, they're scared of people, but if I just force them to encounter more people, um, they'll kind of get over it. They'll see people, people are okay. But what that puppy is instead learning is that they're scared and they actually have no control over um, if they can, if they choose to interact with what scares them or not. So that's why it's really important to work up slowly with socialization. If you have a puppy who's super happy to run up to people and be pet by them, 
that's fine. I wouldn't worry uh, about, you know, like um, getting them to be like afraid of people. But if your puppy is timid, let them be timid. Don't force your puppy to interact with things. Instead, just make it as positive as you can. And then um, work at that distance. Usually with puppies, when they are kind of weary about something and we just work at their distance, the next time they make huge strides and they go way closer. And then the next time even closer. And it actually resolves pretty quickly if we just make sure we're not forcing them to interact with those things. So I just wanted to get that note out there on socialization and, and that how to, but how are we gonna achieve these goals in a pandemic? This is the hard part. And I know uh, something that a lot of you have probably been struggling with or wanting to figure out. And so one thing I will say first off is that you should absolutely follow whatever regulations are within your area. Um, there's a diverse group tonight of people a little bit all over right now. I'm in British Columbia. I'm not allowed uh, to meet with more than one person for an outdoor walk. So that's what I would be limited to. So if I had a puppy right now, how I would be socializing is a couple different strategies. So first thing is your community likely has other puppies in it. There's just likely going to be puppies because of how many puppies are out there right now. Um, so look for some dog training groups or dog lover groups on Facebook and so on and post and see if you could find one other person or if you're allowed a couple, a couple more, ideally with puppies around the age of your puppy. Um, we can do different sizes, um, but that's not something I, I typically recommend if you're not really dog savvy because um, that, you know, if you have a really small puppy with like an Irish wolfhound, <laughs> like a giant puppy, um, that could be dangerous if that bigger dog is not used uh, to small dogs. Um, so try to stick closer to your puppy's size within, you know, about two months of their age is ideal and arrange some outdoor socialization. Your puppy really needs ideally like multiple sessions a week of socializing with other puppies. And why do they need the puppies in particular? Um, it is because puppies are way more forgiving of puppies. Puppies are super rude. Um, they are learning how to be dogs. And that means that they also um, do stuff like bite too hard and they play really rude. They jump and put their paws on the back of another dog and all those things. Um, yeah, adult dogs are just like, get away from me, you're so annoying. And a lot of adult dogs will snap and overcorrect sometimes to puppies and it ends up scaring them. Uh, so we really wanna make sure uh, to socialize them ideally with puppies. You can use some older dogs. There are some great, you know, one-year-old dog as an example um, or two-year-old dogs who love puppies. Um, you know, my dog Buffy loved puppies until she was about six. And then she kind of started to be like, you know what, <laughs> I'm not super into these puppies anymore. Uh, and that's totally reasonable because they're a lot to handle. So um, put some posts out there, meet some new people to arrange um, some new socialization opportunities for your puppy with other puppies. Um, that's also an opportunity for your puppy to meet some new people. So you can definitely do that socially distance uh, puppy uh, meet. So have that other person drop some treats for your puppy or you can drop some on the ground for socializing with people too um you know there are still people outside right uh, people are still walking around traveling and so on so what you can do is um go and sorry just giving my other dog something because i gave it to the other dog <laughs> have to be fair um yeah, so what you can do is just go outside where you know you'll encounter people, bring a lot of yummy high value treats with you and just sit around and as people walk by, reward your puppy. As your puppy is noticing people, reward your puppy. You're building a positive association within their brains um, that's really gonna help them um, make that association later in life. So just keep uh, rewarding your puppy for seeing new people, new things, for those surfaces and objects. I love to explore like, um, wow, that crunching is really loud, sorry. <laughs> um, I love to explore uh, playgrounds. 
you know, not when there's kids there, um, cause obviously we're not supposed to be there usually with dogs. Um, so make sure you clean up after your, your dog as well. Uh, but I like to go get them exploring new surfaces, um, get them maybe jumping up on some like little rocks and, you know, for jumping, like this is a one-off thing. We're not going to practice jumping over and over again because our puppies are still have their growth plates closing. Uh, but just kind of exploring those low, um, exciting surfaces. That's often a place it's really good to get those metal surfaces. Um, but it's all possible right now, even with the pandemic. So I know it's, it was easier before, um, especially with puppy classes, you could just show up and your puppy was going to meet a whole bunch of new people right away. Um, but it's, um, it's just the reality of the situation we live in right now that we need to put a little bit more effort into uh, going and um, socializing our puppy. But, you know, seeing those people will help your puppy uh, be more comfortable, especially if you're creating that positive association. It's a great way to kind of get around, um, you know, having people maybe pet your puppy and so on. because you don't necessarily want to do that during a pandemic although that's completely up to you in terms of uh, your comfort zone and whatever the regulations are in your area. So I will uh, talk a little bit more about socialization when we get to fear, but for now, let's talk about nipping because this came up as a topic that a lot of you are struggling with. So um, nipping, yikes, um, puppies and dogs in general use their mouths a lot. It's part of their communication toolbox. You can probably hear my dogs right now using their mouths, uh, crunching down on some bully sticks that are way louder than I'm used to, <laughs> unfortunately, new brand. Um, but uh, they use their mouths a ton and they communicate with their mouths. And that's, you know, again, um, why our puppies are, are nipping a lot um, because they like to play with their mouths and they don't really know the rules of people right now either. Um, they also are getting their adult teeth coming in and this can last up to about six months. Um, you know, don't be alarmed if you suddenly see blood, a little bit of blood on the floor. That's usually a puppy tooth that came out. Um, see that a lot in puppy classes. And uh, chewing really helps our puppies deal with the pain and discomfort of their teeth coming out. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, like, I don't know if you remember uh, when you were a kid and you were losing a tooth, um, but often it just felt a lot better um, to, you know, be chewing on something or maybe you were compulsively playing with it. Our puppies are like that. It's hard for them to think about other things. They just respond to how they're feeling. So um, doesn't mean we have to be chew toys. So I know um, those puppy teeth are, are razor sharp and um, there's a theory as to why out there. And the theory is that um, it helps them learn bite inhibition. So they don't accidentally hurt things that they're just trying to play with. Cause again, they play with their mouths a lot. Um, you know, you'll see it when puppies are, and even adult dogs play together, they'll grab each other's scruff and so on. And then even when puppies are playing, often we hear this high pitched yelp and the puppies stop. And that's cause one of the puppies actually bit too hard. And so that puppy is now learning, oh, that was a bit too hard. So I better go softer next time. So how do we um, deal with this? It's such a frustrating issue. And honestly, the, the easiest way to do it is uh, managing this issue um, by making sure that we have a lot of appropriate chew items for our puppy. And so appropriate chew items could be things like bully sticks, uh, it could be a Kong that's stuffed with something delicious. Um, it can be even teething toys. There's toys that have, um, they're really tough and you can put them in the freezer so they're nice and cool for your puppy. Um, and so that's one of the most important strategies with your puppy. And then what you're gonna do is redirect them when they try to chew on you, you give them that toy instead. You know, encourage them to keep chewing on that toy because that's going to teach them that this is what they should be chewing instead of your clothes or your hands or your feet and so on. Um, I do feel all, for all of you, it is really painful um, having those puppy teeth. I've had my hands punctured multiple times uh, from puppy play classes just because you know puppies um, don't quite know how much force to use. So it's, uh, it, it's just a, a part of it. It's a natural behavior. Um, we shouldn't ever get angry at our puppies for this either. And um, your socialization with puppy playdates is actually going to help to alleviate that nipping as well. 
because it's going to give your puppies an appropriate outlet, right? So um, often when they aren't getting those play dates, they're like, well, I'm going to just try to play with you instead. And that's not very comfortable. So um, making sure that they have those puppy play dates, again, roughly three a week if you can, that's the ideal, but do the best you can. You know, it is the, a pandemic. So I know things are a little bit tough. Next, we're gonna talk about jumping. This also, again, so they're all based off of your feedback um, that I got through the registration form. And so jumping is a really common issue uh, with puppies. Um, it's actually one of the most common things I get asked about um, from clients who are in puppy classes. And what I like to say with jumping is, you know, like what's the function of this behavior? Like, what is our puppy getting out of it? Well, dogs like to be closer to our faces. Um, so they're just naturally inclined uh, to want to be near a face and our faces are way up top. Um, so they jump up and um, unfortunately, we end up reinforcing them for this all the time, especially when they're small. You know, we have our eight week old puppy. They're so tiny, they jump up, it's so adorable. So we go, oh my God, you're so cute. Um, and then as they get older, um, sorry, just one second, just have to admit some folks here. So as our puppies get older, um, we it's not as cute anymore because they're bigger. Um, maybe we're coming home, well, not right now, but. We used to come home in nice work clothes. We don't want our puppies jumping up on us. Um, and I mean, I just want to say if, if you're okay with jumping, you know, feel free to reinforce it. But most people don't want uh, dogs to jump up on them. And um, even when we yell at them and you go, no, 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 or we push them off, uh, it that's super rewarding for our dogs. It's attention. Um, they're liking it. <laughs> so uh, what I really recommend to do for jumping instead is first off manage it. It's usually when you come home or somebody walks in your door and that's when they kind of get assaulted by your puppy who's decided to uh, jump up all over them. Don't give them that access to that space. Maybe use a dog gate in your entrance uh, so that you can come in, kind of take your jacket off, your boots off, um, and it gives your puppy maybe an opportunity to calm down a little bit for a few seconds before you give them um, that attention. And then also, you should ask your, your puppy for a different behavior or, or set a rule. So I like the uh, four paws on the ground rule. So if my puppy is jumping up, I'm not giving them attention. But as soon as they sit or they just stand there, I give them all the attention that I want to give them. Um, and so that way, the puppies are just going to learn the way that I access the reinforcement that I like, that attention and love is going to be by keeping all four paws on the ground. It's that simple. So that's what we wanna encourage our puppies to do. It is hard um, with family and friends, and maybe this isn't, maybe a silver lining of the pandemic is that some of you aren't dealing with this at all. But usually with this issue, people tell me, oh, well, I'm doing it, but every time, you know, like my mother comes over or my sister, um, they're just, they let the dog jump all over them and they love it you are your dog's advocate. You're the one who says, you know, who can interact with your dog or not. Um, and you set the rules. So if the rule is all four paws must be on the ground, everybody has to respect that rule. So um, just make sure that you make that clear to everybody who is uh, going to be interacting with your puppy. Next is barking. This came up, it was actually uh, pretty high on the list um, for, for you guys in that forum. And so um, I, I guess I, I wanna start with uh, the fact that there's a lot of issues uh, or potential causes, I guess, uh, for barking. So uh, with puppies often barking is, they're just learning to use their voice. Um, this is pretty common. I, I find in puppies under six months, they all of a sudden one day learn that they can bark and then they just start to bark all the time um, at everything, like a leaf on the ground, um, you know, and they just, just, just keep barking at everything. Often that's a phase that it kind of just uh, works itself out. Um, other types of barking, 
attention barking. So that one is pretty obvious. It's usually our dog will literally be standing right in front of you barking at you. Um, another one is fear and reactivity motivated barking. So this type of barking um, is usually directed at something. So directed at people, um, directed at other dogs, uh, maybe directed even at vehicles. And so the dog will be triggered into barking from those things. I can't say for sure without seeing the dog, you know, if it's 100% fear um, caused, but that's typically what it is when I see that kind of reactivity barking. And so, um, sorry, my cell phone is going off in another room. <laughs> Um, so what do we do about barking? Well, um, what I would like to suggest is actually um, working on increasing that mental stimulation. So I, I listed uh, one of the common causes is lack of mental stimulation. Um, that's because often our puppies are essentially barking because they're, they're bored and they don't know what to do. Um, so uh, we'll talk towards the end of this presentation about meeting our puppies needs. Um, but that's one of the things that um, we could do if we uh, improve meeting their mental stimulation needs, and that can mean training, you know, socialization falls into that as well. Um, you know, working on foraging and sniffing and so on will help a lot uh, with uh, barking. So oh, my dog Buffy is coming for a little cameo in this presentation here. Um, so some of those strategies uh, we'll discuss a little later. We can also redirect with barking. So if we have, you know, a dog who likes to bark at the doorbell, as an example, um, we will um, teach our puppy maybe to go on a mat and lay there for lots of yummy treats when we hear the doorbell. So we can set that up as a practice, uh, as an example. Um, we can also just manage the space. A lot of times I see barking caused by dogs looking out the window because there's a window that comes really low using a film, um, you know, one of those frosted films at the bottom of the window and taking away that visual stimulation can actually resolve that issue. So uh, that's a really easy fix for barking. And so when you can fix something with management alone, that's key because it's not, it's not a huge problem. And then once our dog isn't practicing that behavior, they're less likely to continue doing it. Um, so that's it for barking. Walking on leash. This uh, was another topic that lots of you uh, were saying you had struggles with. And so um, for walking on leash, um, I, I should have picked a different side with the dog who's on leash, not one that's off leash. Um, but first off, I wanna talk about harnesses. Um, so you should get a harness for your puppy. Um, even if they're gonna outgrow it, it is very much worth it. Um, we're, there's more and more research showing that uh, even flat buckle collars um, are harmful to your dog's neck. There's lymph nodes in their necks. There's all kinds of important um, physiological traits. And so even though they're often the ones putting the pressure on that themselves, um, it, it doesn't change that we have to help them manage it. Um, so invest in a good harness. I really like harnesses that have both a front and back clip harness. Um, it'll make it easier if you are really struggling with a dog who's pulling a lot, especially as they get stronger, you can clip on the front. And then I really like the ones that don't necessarily go right across the shoulders, uh, but come up in the middle or have a Y shape uh, just because they don't impact the gait of the dog in that case. Um, but there's tons and tons of options out there for um, these really great harnesses. They don't need to break the bank. Um, and so I really recommend getting one for all of the walking you do with your puppy. It'll also help you um, once you, you know, eventually work with like a long line as an example, you can clip it to the harness. Those aren't really safe to put on a collar just because they can put extra pressure, especially if the puppy runs the whole line out. Um, yeah, the second thing I wanted to mention is standard leashes. Um, often I hear people having struggle they're struggling with their puppies uh, walking loosely, but they have one of those retractable leashes. Um, don't get those. Um, I really don't recommend them, especially the ones with the thin cable. They're dangerous. They have been known to severely injure both people and dogs. Um, so standard six foot leash is really um, going to help you a lot with your walks. It's going to help you um, create some more engagement with your puppy. And yeah, it's uh, that's really, um, 
just in terms of gear, my biggest recommendation, a harness and a standard leash. Now there's two typical problems associated with walking on leash. And there's the puppy that refuses to walk on leash and there's the puppies that pull too much. And so firstly, with the puppies that refuse to walk on leash, that's usually because there's some discomfort with the way the harness or the leash and all that feels. Um, and, or just fear, sometimes it's, it's kind of fear um, based. And so it's hard to say the exact solution, but um, really my first step with this would always be to work in slow increments, just like if we're socializing our puppy and they are unsure about something, we're gonna go and work at their pace. We'll do the same thing with walking on leash. So maybe we'll start with just putting the leash on the dog and rewarding the dog for tolerating that leash on the dog. And then after that, maybe we'll tolerate two steps and the dog did great. So we reward the puppy and we continue increasing that. And as we do that, it doesn't, you know, we're not always increasing in like two foot increments because over time the puppy just becomes more comfortable. The puppy starts to realize that they, this leash allows them to access the outdoors and they get to explore things and it's fun. But a lot of puppies will need that slow introduction to walking on a leash. The other one is puppies that pull too much. Um, so dogs have opposition reflex. Um, it's essentially, they feel something pull and rather than relinquish, they pull harder. Um, it makes them really great sled dogs for most cases, which is awesome. It just means that it's hard to walk them. Um, and often, you know, with our puppies, when they're small, we kind of let them pull around because they're small, they can't pull that hard. And then they get to 50 pounds and all of a sudden, you're having to see your physiotherapist because your shoulder hurts a lot. <laughs> um, so we really should be working on this. And so how do we work on, you know, puppies that are pulling too much? Well, um, you know, a loose leash walking um, protocol is ideal for that. So that means um, loose leash walking is essentially just that no tension on the leash. I'm not talking about healing, um, which is, you know, an obedience trial trick where your dog is walking right, right next to you. I'm just talking about not having pressure on the leash, but you know, that also means your dog can walk a little bit behind you, a little bit in front of you, uh, just not pulling your arm off. And to do that, we create engagement. So we make it rewarding for a dog to check in with us and, you know, want to be maybe next to us and, uh, you know, just we're becoming a good thing outside. And that means we have to compete with all the things outside. <laughs> so that means competing with all the interesting smells. Um, it means competing uh, with new things to explore. And, you know, when our puppies are socializing, we don't want to tell them not to explore. Um, so we're, what I recommend doing is um, having treats with you. Really, uh, if you don't have one already, investing in a good treat pouch is just a really good idea. You will use it uh, throughout the entire uh, time you have your dog and bring those high value food with you. So I like to use things like freeze dried beef liver. It breaks up really small. You can even buy it broken up really small. I pack that in my treat pouch. And then um, as I'm walking, I'll get my dog to engage with me, maybe by making some noises. Um, and then I reward them for that engagement and I reward them always close to me. So I'm not reaching ahead and giving them a cookie. I'm always making sure that they come and they're right next to my thigh. I use what I call the reward zone between my knee and my hip. And so my dog has to be there. And over time, my dog is, learned, oh, okay, it's really rewarding if I check in. It's really rewarding if I am nearby. So um, yeah, that's the kind of thing that we want to do to improve that walking on leash. Now, if you're really struggling, again, the harness with the front clip will give, will at least alleviate the tension on your arm for now. And then I, I really recommend um, if it's a huge issue for you to work with a trainer or sign up for a puppy class, because um, most puppy classes, should cover that in, including uh, mine that will be coming in the new year. House training was also brought up as an issue that uh, many of you are dealing with. So uh, we will go through that today. So um, most of you, if you have older puppies are probably not dealing with this anymore. If you are having occasional accidents in your home and you think your puppy is potty trained, 
they probably aren't fully potty trained. You probably need to do a little bit more training. Um, you know, an accident because, oh, you you left the house way longer than you'd ever left before. That's typical and, and probably not your dog's fault. Um, they just have smaller bladders. But, um, you know, if you have like a year old puppy and they can't last four hours uh, without a potty break, then that might actually just be an issue where um, you're, you need to work on some house training. So I'll talk uh, first about really young puppies because that's usually when we're doing house training. So when you're in your home with your puppy, you should uh, be supervising your puppy or they should be in a crate and pen area. And so that's an area that you're setting up for your puppy um, when you can't be actively supervising them. This is called management. Um, so it's just managing the environment that your puppy is in to set them up for success. And in your crate and pen area, there should always be a pee pad or, um, you know, I just, when, with my last puppy, I just used a rubber mat and some newspaper. Um, you don't have to use pee pads, but you need something that your puppy can eliminate on because um, you're likely not always going to be able to take them out every single hour. And that's what we should be doing when we take them out is every single hour when they're little puppies, and then we slowly increase that time. And what we do is we go outside with the puppy, and then we give them three to five minutes. They can be on leash, or if you have a fenced yard, they can be off leash. It's up to you. Um, I prefer to do it leashed, um, but three to five minutes. If your puppy doesn't do their business in that time, then you're gonna come back inside. You're gonna wait 30 minutes. And then that 30 minutes, your puppy is either in their pen or they're being supervised. And then you go outside again. And when they do their business, you're gonna say, yes, you're gonna reward them. Again, you should always pretty much have treats on you all the time with, with a puppy. So a treat pouch is gonna be a great thing. Uh, and then, after that treat reward, I, it works really well to do a short play session or even a mini walk, like, you know, go down the block for a couple of houses and come back. Um, if, again, if your puppy finds this rewarding, if your puppy is scared of walks, that's not a good reward. But if your puppy is really enticed by exploring the neighborhood, that's a really great way to reward um, them doing a potty break. And so that's all there is to it we are essentially just building the environment uh, so that our puppy learns that it's more rewarding to wait and do their business outside than it is to do it inside. But we have to be fair about it. We have to make sure that they can actually hold it as long as we're asking them to. And we have to do things like, you know, when we first get up in the morning, we have to go and let them in right away. Um, because if we go and uh, have coffee first, there are going to have an accident. Puppies usually um, defecate almost immediately uh, after getting up and usually within a half an hour of eating. So again, those are times we wanna make sure we're, we're setting up for success and having time to bring our puppies outside. So common mistakes I see, um, not supervising the puppy when they're out of their crate and pen area. So then the puppy runs off, finds somewhere to go do their business. And then you have an accident to clean up. Uh, the other one I see is that leaving the puppy outside alone. So you, put, you open the door, you let your puppy out, uh, you go back five minutes later, you let them in, you assume that they did their business, but often they did not do their business. <laughs> and then they come back inside and do their business. Um, really also another uh, benefit to being out there with them is that when you go out there, you can say, do your business. And if you say that every time, you actually end up putting that on cue. And if you're wondering why is it really handy um, to have a dog who can do their business on cue, well, if you do show dogs, most people in show dogs um, like to have their dog do their business on cue. Um, but I found it really, really beneficial because I can go out in my front yard and say, do your business. And my dog Buffy will do your business. I pick it up and then I leave the full huge poop bank at home instead of walking around with it uh, for my entire walk. So that's just one example of how it can be really, really useful. Um, not necessary, but just, you know, one of the kind of positive side effects of house training your puppy this way.
All right, um, we are making good time. It's been about 15 minutes and we're about to get into a pretty big topic and that is fear. And uh, like I said, it um, was about half of you uh, who registered with the form uh, told me that you're dealing with fear issues. And so let's talk first about what's normal for fear in our puppies. So puppies experience different fear stages throughout their development. Uh, the first one is eight to 10 weeks, right around there. You know, there are puppies who'll start at like seven weeks and there are puppies that'll go to like 11, 12 weeks. Um, it's, you know, everything is unique, just like our dogs are unique. Um, but this is around the time where it happens. And so some puppies, for example, if um, they were put on an airplane at this time, they could develop a fear with airplanes and noises that are similar to that. Uh, just from this uh, fear stage. And because what's happening in the fear stage is our, our puppies have pretty big reactions to things that are either new or even things that they have seen before. Um, and, and it can be, um, I don't want to say scarring, but it, it essentially can be, it can create some lifelong associations for them. The six to 15 months is the typical secondary fear stage. Um, and I will say some dogs have like tertiary, so like three fear stages. I've seen that before. Again, we're talking about unique individuals. Um, so it's, these are just guidelines and they're not for sure. I've also had dogs who just never have really a second fear stage. <laughs> so it's all um, depends on the dog, but um, yeah, they're vulnerable when you'll see it um, in your teenager. So after six months that your dog is a teenager, you'll be maybe out walking and all of a sudden your super confident puppy is just terrified of something really really cautiously approaching it stiffening up on the body kind of sulking not sure what to do and if it looks unusual and they've never shown fear like that before that's just likely a fear stage and so we'll work through that like we would with a socialization um, we're going to get our puppies to um, take some food, ideally. And if they're not taking food, um, it's usually because they're too scared. So move further away. That's always a good sign. Um, but, you know, just work at their pace. You do not have to force them to interact um, with the object, but we can reward them maybe for just looking at it. And if we keep it positive, these fear stages just kind of go away and our puppies continue on uh, with their confident selves. So that's pretty um, typical. Some puppies are just more timid than others. So that means that they're just more naturally um, going to be a little bit more fearful. Um, you know, when I was running puppy classes before, I always had kind of like the quieter, more timid side play group and the more excited side, um, just because they're also individuals. Um, but there's also, you know, fear that can be concerning. So before we get into that, what is fear driven by? A lot of times it's genetics. Um, you know, mom and dad were really, really fearful dogs and that has passed on to this puppy or, um, you know, maybe it's just one of the parents. Uh, a lot of times with rescues, and again, this isn't a reason not to get one, um, we don't know the background. So we don't know if our puppy is predisposed uh, to fear, um, you know, things like that. So genetics can play a huge role and poor socialization um, is often another reason. And I don't wanna, if you are worried that you have poorly socialized your puppy, um, don't feel any guilt here. Um, it's pretty hard sometimes uh, to figure out exactly what your puppy needs uh, for socialization. So, you know, sometimes we're doing the best and we think we're doing the right thing and it's just not the right thing for that puppy. Um, so it's not necessarily that you've done a poor job. It's just that the socialization didn't work as intended. Um, but if you didn't socialize your puppy um, and now you're dealing with fear, it's likely due to socialization. Um, but we can never be sure um, unless we know all of the genetics from our dog, if genetics plays a role or not. So. Um, yeah, this is a complicated issue. Um, and if you have a puppy who has no, not improved at all on fear, um, a puppy who is constantly afraid, a puppy who 
um, yeah, just sees no improvement, even when you're trying to build that positive association. That's a pretty big red flag. Um, and I would reach out to a good trainer for that. Um, I can help with that, but I'm not the only good trainer out there. There's a ton of them. <laughs> um, and I'm always happy uh, to refer if you want to like work in person and you're not in Revelstoke. Um, I know lots of great trainers all over who can help with this. But um, like I said, I was a little worried about um, how many people reported fear as an issue with their puppies um, because our puppies um, shouldn't be scared very much past those fear stages. Um, and they should certainly be seeing improvement in their fear. And if they're not, um, get to a trainer as quickly as possible um, because it, uh, it, it, it just, there's no quick fix. As I wrote on the slide, there really is no quick fix for fear. Um, it's a lot. We need to work on changing the emotional response of the dog from fear to this is okay. And that is done systematically and slowly and always below the threshold, which means we're not putting the dog in the situations that scares it all the time so that it can actually learn. Because if you're terrified of spiders, and somebody decided to teach you how to do a complex math equation while there's a spider crawling on the desk in front of you, you're not gonna learn a thing, right? <laughs> and our puppies are the same way, our dogs are the same way. If they're scared, um, we're, they're not going to learn. So in order to help them fix these issues, we have to learn, we have to find the right spot where we can expose them, but in a way where they're not scared. So usually that's a distance equation as example. But I just uh, really want to um, hopefully make it as clear as possible that if you're struggling with this, um, please, please reach out. Um, it's, I am a dog trainer today <laughs> because I have a fearful dog. <laughs> um, I adopted my dog, Cody, um, and I, he, I like to say tricked me. Um, but when I went to see him, he was very normal. Um, and they thought I had steak in my pocket because, and I didn't understand that as a warning sign that he doesn't usually react that way. And then I brought him home and he couldn't walk across the street <laughs> um, because he was too scared. And so I, um, yeah, I became a dog trainer purely because I, I needed a huge amount of information to help him. I didn't know how to help him. And, um, yeah, it's, it's taken a lot of work to get him to a place where he has a much more comfortable life and, you know, fear doesn't control every aspect of his day. So um, it's not an issue to leave to resolve itself is the point I'm making. <laughs> um, definitely seek help if you are struggling with fear. So we're starting to near uh, the end. And I do have a couple of Q and A's. I know some of you uh, emailed some specific questions in, so I will uh, get to those. Um, but I wanna talk first about meeting the needs of your puppy. So dogs have needs, uh, just like people, they have biological needs, you know, food, um, health, uh, exercise, shelter, that kind of thing, just really basic stuff. Um, they also have emotional needs, just like people. Um, if you didn't know the science on dogs is settled, so dogs do have emotions. Um, we don't think they're as developed necessarily as adults, um, but they're probably similar to, you know, like a toddler, right? Like, um, you know, dogs can feel jealousy as an example. Um, so they, they have emotions, which also means that um, they have emotional needs. So they need to feel security. Um, they need to be able to trust. Um, they need love. And so, those are needs that we have to meet as dog guardians. They also have social needs. Um, they need to bond and play. And that's with both dogs and people. And th those needs vary per dog. So some dogs are super dog social and others would much rather hang out with people um, or just very specific dogs. And that's okay. Um, but they have social needs that need to be met. And they also have natural behavioral needs um, such as foraging, sniffing, digging, exploring, being dogs, you know, even like chewing um, dogs, a lot of their natural behaviors we find really, really annoying, but these are things that come natural to our dogs. So it's not fair for us to get angry with them when they do it. Uh, instead, what we need to do is 
find the right outlets to, for them to meet their needs that fit within our human world, right? So uh, often behavior problems are actually the result of dogs not having their needs fully met. Um, you'd be amazing, or you'd be amazed to see how many things uh, get resolved when a dog is um, just has their needs met, you know, has an opportunity to be a dog in an environment where that's okay. So how do we meet these needs? Uh, well, I think the biological is, is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not a veterinarian. I don't recommend specific diets. I'm not um, at all certified in canine nutrition, um, but there are people who are. So if you have questions about that, you can easily find some. Their emotional needs, that's, you know, making sure that they feel secure. Um, if you have a fearful dog, that might require a little bit more work for you. But um, one thing that I like to do is, is provide dogs with some agency. So that means allowing dogs to make decisions. Um, sometimes that means my dog dictates where we go on a walk. Uh, sometimes that means I provide my dog with a couple of different options and they pick. Um, you know, just allowing them some form of decision making can help increase their sense of security. The social needs, again, uh, with the pandemic, a little bit harder, but not impossible. So um, set up those play dates for your puppies, get that socialization in, then you're meeting your social needs at the same time. You're also going to be helping with your puppy nipping. I know it's going to be a little bit more work, um, but please, um, you know, set them up, put the effort in. You will thank yourself later once you have a well socialized puppy. Um, and then natural behavior needs, foraging, sipping, digging, exploring, um, you know, digging, a lot of people build um, sandboxes. Not all dogs love to dig a ton. So, um, you know, it's not, not necessarily something you have to do. Um, but I like to recommend, especially for puppies, is um, don't feed your puppy in a bowl. Um, this is probably really hard to do um, if you're feeding raw. And if you are, you know, you can use things like puzzle um, bowls and so on to do that. Or you can stuff the raw into Kongs and freeze it. But make your puppy um, have to kind of use some of their natural behaviors to get their food. So um, this, oops, sorry. Um, this photo here is a snuffle mat. So it's just a bunch of fleece materials that's tied through this like rubber mat. And what you do is you put the, if they're on kibble, you put all the kibble in there and you hide it. And then you let your puppy figure out how to find it. You can get toys that dispense food, like uh, the red um, Kong wobbler there. That one is kind of noisy. If you have an apartment, um, might not be the best choice if there's someone below you, uh, but there's like this little orange ball that's uh, quite similar and rubber and quite quiet. So that's another alternative. Um, there's the puzzle toy on the right as an example. That's a really easy way uh, to add some of that in their lives. And then there's also just letting your puppy sniff on walks. Um, I know it can be really frustrating. I have a dog who loves to sniff and it can take me 15 minutes to go a block. Um, and yeah, I'm just standing out there. I usually have one headphone in listening to a podcast <laughs> to make it go by better. But most of the walks for my dogs are their walks. And so if they want to spend five minutes sniffing a spot, I let them because sniffing also helps your dog actually lower their heart rate. It calms them down. Um, so really, really good, especially for fearful dogs. And uh, we can encourage more sniffing by actually using a long line. So I put an image over here. Um, so this long line is, um, you know, it's a, it's a leash, basically, usually over uh, 10 feet, I say go at least 20 feet, and it gives your puppy a little bit more freedom, but it's still controlled. And you could even use it um, in a play date, for example, um, if you are meeting, I forgot to mention this, if you are meeting somebody for a puppy play date, and it's not in an enclosed environment, uh, attach the leash to the harness and drop the leash. And that way it's safe. You know, you can always go and grab that leash if you need to, um, but we don't wanna, you know, set up our puppies in a situation that could be dangerous. And then the long line allows us to give our puppies a little bit more freedom uh, so that they can go explore, sniff, maybe dig, all while being on the long line. So a really good um, 
tool to help meet your puppy's needs. But think about those categories and think about, um, you know, are you meeting them? Um, is there something that your dog is maybe showing you like some kind of frustrated behavior? Um, a lot of these are just from not having their needs met. Um, so that's an easy fix uh, for us. Finally, I just want to share a couple resources before I go to the Q&A. Uh, so uh, if you are not versed in dog language, which is pretty much all body language, I really recommend that you guys um, get uh, some free resources online, like this poster on the left, which is by Lily Chin, um, is free. You can go to her website. She's got a ton of free resources up there, or you can get her book. This isn't sponsored. I just think it's a great idea. She's got some cartoons that really help to break down how dogs communicate. You need to know how your puppy communicates to understand what's going on through their heads, how they feel. Um, so I'm really recommending that you all uh, go out and find um, those resources. That's just one of them. WAG um, is another book for those of you who maybe want to learn a little bit more about what the sign says about making your dog happy. Um, Zizi Todd, who's also another dog trainer, um, has put a, a lot of great resources together. She cites the science, it's plain language, and it really uh, breaks down how you can use um, these scientific findings to improve your relationship with your dog and make your dog happy. And if you're a real keener uh, and you want to learn a lot more about how dogs learn, and learning theory, I really recommend uh, Don't Shoot the Dog. So a really good classic book. I don't know a dog trainer who's not read Don't Shoot the Dog. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's really one of the books that um, changed the direction of dog training and helped us make sure that it was um, a little bit um, more humane, I guess, and, and also based in science. So, um, I just want to go uh, quickly to the the Q and A. So um, we, I got a couple of specific questions. I tried to address, like I said, some of them uh, just by the topics we chose today. But somebody asked uh, specifically about um, two puppies in the car, roughly I think six or seven months apart, and <laughs> that they're not very calm together. So um, yeah, it. This is not to be unexpected, especially if they're both young dogs. It's really exciting traveling in the car. Um, the first step always with things like this, because this, it would be quite simple um, if you can, is to separate. There's a lot of car um, separators that you can use. Um, you know, sometimes you put a dog in the back and sometimes one on the back seat, if you have like a hatchback as an example, or an SUV, um, or you can get also dividers that divide um, down the middle of a seat. So that's just, that's management. That's taking away the opportunity for the dogs to kind of like be a little bit crazy together. Um, the other thing would be to uh, do some setups. So bring the car, the dogs in there. Ideally with two dogs, you'd have two handlers. And so the two handlers would be rewarding the dogs for being calm in the car. So getting them to sit and lay down and just be calm, um, you know, not letting uh, or encouraging them and making that behavior rewarding so that they know that that's what's expected of them. And that's also what just works out better for them. They get to, you know, get yummy rewards. You can even try, um, especially if the dogs are pretty good together and there's no resource guarding issues. Uh, I've had some people use stuffed Kongs when they travel in the car. So each dog gets a stuffed frozen Kong, you know, things like plain yogurt um, works well for some dogs, others, um, peanut butter, um, you know, things like that in there. Wet canned food is always popular too. You freeze it and then give it to the dogs and then they get to um, use that while um, that you're traveling. But that's what I would recommend to start, um, just trying some management strategies and then you can try the training with, you know, ha doing the setup. So getting in the car with both dogs, rewarding that calm behavior. And you can do this with one dog too, if your dog is really, really excited in the car, uh, which is often a better problem than the common problem of your dog is um, really anxious in the car. So I uh, had another question about fence barking. So the dog barking at strangers at the fence and so this sounds like it's probably um, 
motivated by fear. Again, it's hard to say with just uh, a couple of lines. Um, what I would do for that is, um, first off, I and this can be hard, especially if, if it's winter where you are, um, it, it can be really difficult to stand out there, but you should be outside with your dog um, because the more they practice this behavior and the more it's gonna happen, um, and what you should be doing is having some high value food rewards with you. Um, so if your dog really loves uh, a treat, having those treats with you, um, other high value foods, I mentioned the freeze dried beef liver, but um, there's also the uh, hot dogs. You buy cheap hot dogs, cut them up really small, very high value. Um, and so you use that and then um, you just wait until you see somebody coming up maybe. And as soon as your dog notices it, you're going to go, yes, and reward and just feed the dog treats as you go. All right. So just keep feeding them uh, the cookies as the person walks by. What we want the dog to learn is that when strangers come by, it means lots of good things happen. It doesn't mean it's a scary thing. So that was it for those, the Q and A's I couldn't quite get in uh, the general topics. Um, we're nearing the end here. Oh, sorry, feeding my dog, um, my anxious dog some treats tonight uh, as the snow has been falling off our roof. Um, and that's what you heard. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and first off, I'd like to invite you, if you do have um, some puppies, um, please feel free to turn on your camera and show me your puppies. <laughs> um, but uh, no pressure if you don't want to. Um, I know some of you are probably just sitting at home doing uh, watching this in your PJs. Um, and uh, I did get another, um, another message in question about, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the chats now, you guys, it was hidden before, um, about separation anxiety. So, a uh, couple of things. Oh, puppy. <laughs> Thank you so much. So cute. Um, so for separation anxiety, uh, it's hard. First off, it, it's, it's pretty hard to say um, just from the message if it is. So separation anxiety is really focused on when uh, some specific people leave. Um, and so the dog's okay, you know, um, potentially if the dog's okay, maybe with another person on the house, it's so maybe some more isolation anxiety. Oh my gosh, so many cute dogs. Um, what I would say is if you are struggling with this and you cannot leave the house, um, it is, it, it's not, it, I can't provide you with something that would fix that on this call today. Um, it's just a really complex issue and it requires um, some very big, uh, no, I shouldn't say big, but some specific protocols uh, to work on this. Um, so uh, you can feel free to email me after if you want, and we can discuss it a little bit later. I do offer, um, you know, free 15 minute phone uh, consultations with anybody, um, but it's, it's just too complicated of an issue. And it's really unique to every single dog uh, to be able to address it in this webinar, unfortunately. But all of these puppies are so cute. I'm so happy right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is one of my favorite parts of doing this. Um, yeah, so I I offered this up really because I wanted to introduce myself because um, a lot of people knew me as Mountains and Mutts on Instagram, but not Stoke Dogs. Um, and also because it's been a weird year and um, there's a lot of puppies and I'm seeing a lot of fear and that was really very much realized um, when with that uh, registration form. And um, I just, uh, I, I decided actually today um, that to help anybody who is struggling, especially with fear, that I was going to offer a special associated with this. So I do, right now I do not have any classes. Um, I'm, I'm planning to in the new year, for sure virtually, maybe some in person in Revelstoke, um, if, if the pandemic restrictions kind of ease up and I can uh, without it being a health risk. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I really right now I've been just doing private virtual consults and I typically charge $125 um, for that comes with a 45 minute consultation. And then um, you get a training plan out of that, a big summary, like lots of protocol sheets. Oh, the, the, 
dogs who are playing. That's just so cute. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I decided for today to actually offer that up. Um, if anybody here today is really struggling and needs that help, um, if you reach out to me by um, the end of December, we can set one of those up uh, for $97 instead of $125. Um, I just want to help. I can't work for free, unfortunately. <laughs> I also have bills to pay like everyone else, um, but I wanted to do that just uh, because it seems like there's a lot of people who are having a hard time out there. Um, puppies should be a lot of fun. They're still, they're always going to be hard work too, and they're always going to test us. Um, but it, you know, if you're struggling a lot and you can't wait for a puppy class or you have issues like separation anxiety or fear-based issues that no one's going to be able to address in a puppy class. Um, those are really not, uh, those are one-on-one -on -one puppy uh, issues and dog issues. They're not really, um, you just can't have a class to teach separation anxiety. So if you're dealing with those issues, just reach out to me. Um, I'll follow up today with a recording of uh, this. So I'm going to upload it and send you all a link so you can go uh, reference it. Um, and then I will also just include the link if you do uh, feel like taking advantage of that. I'm okay if you guys share that as well, if you know somebody who's struggling. Um, I can work, I will say, I can only work with people in Canada. Um, that's just the reality of my insurance policy. Um, and, uh, but if you need help anywhere else, I know lots of great trainers um, all over and I'm so happy to take the time and help you find a good trainer. Honestly, I would much rather you reach out um, and have, have me help you find a trainer than go find one if you're not sure who you should be looking for. It's the wild west out there. Um, you know, we just, it was just announced today on, on Instagram of some really, really horrible situation where a dog ended up, you know, almost dying uh, because they were sent to a trainer who used obviously some really inappropriate methods. And I don't want that to happen to any of your puppies. Um, so I'm always there if you guys just need a, a recommendation for somebody to work with. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope this has been of value um, to at least some of you that maybe you learned something. Um, for those of you who are in Revelstoke, um, I am working to organize uh, some puppy play times in the new year. And I'm actually gonna work uh, with another local trainer, Ruff and Revy, um, who also does group walks, by the way, she's awesome. Um, she is uh, even does group walks um, with one of my dogs. Um, anyways, and uh, yeah, I will, I'll, I'll post about that. And I know quite a few of you have asked me to keep you posted on puppy classes. So I will keep everybody informed for that locally. And yeah, I hope it was useful. Thank you so much for all these adorable puppies. Oh my gosh, so cute. Um, yeah, I'm just very psyched that you guys um, all decided to show up here and sit with me for an hour and a bit and talk about puppies. Um, yeah, that'll be it. So I will share, oh my gosh, so cute. Oh, I don't know, my dog Cody can't really, let's see, I'll just show you guys mine. <laughs> he just wants more cookies <laughs> so anyways um that's it for tonight um thank you everybody and i will hopefully offer some more of these throughout next year as well i'm on some different topics but yeah if you're struggling reach out and i wish you all the best of luck with all of your puppies and i hope they grow up to be really confident dogs and if they're if they're not, there's always somebody who's going to be able to help you. Um, so if I'm not that person, I will help you find that person. So have a good night, everybody.